Websites identical to trusted government pages. We've got this week's latest scam sites and the giveaway clues they don't want you to know. Yeah, plus a fifth of UK homes suffer from dangerous mould and damp. Find out why bleach won't stop the spreading and what really does work. And we'll show you how you could be making hundreds of pounds this weekend, selling your unwanted clothes, toys and even the corks from your bottle of wine. Hello and welcome to Morning Live on a Friday. We've made it through another week in January and that's good and news, then, isn't it? it's my first slightly longer show. I know, it goes on for ages. <laughs> I hope you haven't got, any, <laughs> I hope got any plans this afternoon. I'm actually be older. quite excited because I'm in very good company this morning. Right, Look indeed. at this crew. We've got Nick Stapleton, Dr Puna, Hello. Dr James oh. Greenwood. Yeah. So I'm going to have a lovely time. You're right, sold. Uh, lovely. Um, <laughs> James, I haven't seen you for a few weeks. And actually yeah. a story that keeps coming back that we've been wanting to ask you about is about the XL uh, bully dog. They're back in the headlines uh, today, actually. Mm. Well, what's going on? What's the latest with this? Yeah, it's it's uh, an ongoing situation, I think that's the way to put it. In England and Wales, um, from the 31st of December, it's become now an illegal uh, offence to sell, breed, give away or abandon an ex mm. bully, And they must be microchipped, neutered, kept on a lead, muzzled and insured. In, at all times. So things have already changed. What hadn't changed is anything in Scotland. And so we were seeing evidence of this influx of XL bullies moving up to Scotland. Right. So the Scottish government have now said that they are also going to follow these guidelines and also introduce a ban very similar to the England and yeah. Welsh ban. It's a very, it's a very, I think it's fair Tricky to say it's a very situation. difficult decision. Yeah. It's a very really, difficult situation. Really hard, yeah. um, my advice really to everybody is to just, if you own an XL bully, especially in England and Wales at the moment, do get yourselves up to speed with the rules. There is still time for you to apply for an exemption. Uh, and so, you know, just 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 get yourself ready because they are these changes are coming across the you know across the UK. So familiarise yourself yeah. with, with the rules. Exactly. Uh, our inbox is full uh, of questions for you. We've got uh, uh, new pet owners, haven't we? Ask yeah. Questions. We've got. We've got all sorts coming up. We've got a load of new pet owners have, yeah. have sent us all sorts of interesting questions. Especially today, we're going to be talking about overweight pets. Mm -hmm. After Christmas, you know, January, we're all sort of a bit sluggish. Same for our pets. So I'm going to give you lots of <laughs> advice about how to uh, how to combat. See, them. loads of questions, and we've got time for them now. I know. Because <laughs> we're on until 7 p.m. <laughs> Lovely. I'm so excited. <laughs> and with energy costs rising again this month, people are looking for ways to cut back on household bills. And today, we're meeting a couple who've gone to extreme dream lengths for their whole street. I love this. So we find out why they slept on the roof for 23 days to get solar panels for their neighbours and how it's lowered some of their energy bills by 70%. Isn't it brilliant? It is some story, that. It is. Uh, that's in about 10 minutes. And straight after that, we're talking to the stars of the hit BBC drama Men Up. Have you seen it yet? Yes, so good. It's, brilliant. It's, it's so superb. Good. It's the incredible real-life story of five men from Swansea at the centre of the world's first Viagra trials. Yes, then about quarter past ten, Dr Poonam, you're going to be looking after our hearts because there are so many cold weather warnings, obviously, yes. across the UK at the moment and it really does have an impact, doesn't it? I'm, I'm quite relieved I thought you were going to talk about my love life again. <laughs> we'll be here forever, Gethin. Yeah, I'll be like this. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> but you're absolutely right. It's been really chilly, OK? <laughs> it's been very, very chilly. Mm. And the Met Office has predicted that next week, actually, the temperature's going to drop even further to minus 10 in minus some parts. 10. I know. Wow. But what some people don't actually connect is that the cold weather is actually not good for the heart and it can increase your risk of having a heart attack and strokes. So we're going to chat about that, how to lower some of these risks and also I'm going to show you a really cool exercise that you can do whilst brushing your teeth that can lower your blood pressure. Mm. Great idea. Exercise is key to so many things. We do our one minute at the end of every show, of course, with uh, Strictly Fitness. If you've been watching this week, you'll know that <laughs> we've <have>. supersized <laughs> it with the gladiators. It's gladiator uh, fitness. But you don't have to be superhuman to do it. It is for everyone. The theme tune, a guy who's pressing the button for the theme tune is keen because the show is back tomorrow. You can do it now because Reese is joined by another gladiator, Reese. <laughs> this is the gladiator with three minutes million followers. Some would say that we saved the best to last. That's some being him. It's Legend. Welcome, Legend. It's an honor to have you with us. You're welcome. You're welcome.
<laughs> All right. Um, so uh, this is uh, the part where we're going to have you do some of your moves with us for Gladiator Fitness, which is going to be side lunges based on one of your favourite events. Tell us all about it. So collision. Essentially, contenders need to run across the suspension bridge to get balls in buckets to get points. We're swinging, trying to get them. I say trying. For me, I, I am getting them, but the goal is basically to stop them from getting across and getting points. You radiate such a warmth, legend. <laughs> I've been told that before, yeah. Do you ever like, smile? Do you, do you know what that is? When you like, <laughs> like you do that? Don't talk. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, so uh, tune in. We'll be doing that at the end of the show. Are you, are you uh, okay sorry. over there, Reese? I feel like I'm you scared. need to come and yeah, come bit. up here with us in this bit. safe so, space. Legend seems like a nice, nice guy. Lovely guy. Lovely guy. I remember guy. Wolf has been the, the bank. Yeah. yeah. It's all good though, isn't it? The kids are going to love it. I can't good. wait to watch it. It's going to be great. All that coming up, but we're actually heading into our own battle at the moment. So many of us are when we take on the scammers because people are being targeted by criminals offering fake government loans, grants and benefits. Right now that's happening, isn't it, Nick? It's all getting a bit confusing. Mm -hmm. What's going on, please? It is the, the most government time of the year, of course. Mid to late Jan, <laughs> we're all going to have interactions with a number of different government departments. I am a freelance person, lots of other self-employed people are going to have to do their self-assessment. But there are also 11 million people who are about to get their final winter fuel payment from the government before January 26th mm -hmm. deadline. There's also nearly a quarter of a million of us who are eligible to claim back on average £6,000 on their state pension because of an IT glitch. Now, of course, that is an opportunity for scammers because there's going to be all these people who maybe don't know how to do a thing, maybe they've not done it before. That is a window for our scammers to jump through. And uh, we've said it before, haven't we? But these websites look so realistic, mm. don't they? Yes, they are getting very, very good at making the face. Yeah. And I think we've got an example that we're going to show you on the screen. Uh -huh. um, can you guys work it out? Which one's fake okay, and which, which one's look. legit? Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? From when it's, you we've been listening first to glance. the tips, though, so we we know what to look for, but it's not always that straightforward. It's really it? hard, and it's the one on the left that is the fake, and the way you can tell is, first of all, by the web address. So that URL, if it's a government website, it should end .gov.uk. Of course, this one does not. It's got .gov in there, but then it's got some random thing afterwards. Any government website's yeah. got to have that .gov.uk ending. That's the other thing, it is, yeah, so it's a really important point, and the other thing you can tell with that one is it's a winter fuel payment website and it's got a big apply now button. You don't need to apply for your winter fuel payment. You will get it automatically. So that mm -hmm. one there is a dead giveaway. Yeah, they're bringing you in though because you see that button and you immediately think, I just okay. want to press there it. Make sure you check, stop and check. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just online though, is it? There are scam calls and messages going on at this time of year. Of course. And I think there's a big one at the moment with text messages about tax yeah. refunds. Mm -hmm. So this is a scam text. It's complete nonsense. It's nothing to do with HMRC at all and it's reeling you in by saying here's some money that you're owed mm -hmm. all you've got to do is click on this link and you'll be able to get it back that link is again nothing to do with the government it's got yeah. the letters gov in there but it doesn't end gov.uk so you can be sure that if you click on that you'll be going through to something that's entirely illegitimate mm -hmm. hmrc do occasionally send text messages but they'll never be asking you for the kind of personal financial information that you might have to give away if you click through on that link there and it's worth bearing in mind as well that any phone calls coming out the blue i know i always say this just assume they're a scam until proven otherwise yeah. best thing you can do is just say hey i'm not sure you are who you say you are i'm just going to hang up and call you back on a number that i can find for whatever organization it is that you claim to represent yeah. same goes for emails check that sender really? click on the sender's name is it an official government web uh, email address at the end after the app, yeah. ie.gov.uk. Just check it, yeah. And uh, there are a lot of government funds that we do need to apply for, though. So where is the correct place to go for these? It's always going to be in a website that ends with .gov.uk. .gov.uk. <laughs> yes, and if you want your winter fuel payments or you're receiving universal credit, you can go to .gov.uk and just check your eligibility mm. there. You don't um, have to go and get your winter fuel payment. You do not. You? That's going to come in, but you can check your eligibility. Yeah, eligibility. Exactly right. So you yeah. don't need to actually apply. You just need to go and check whether or not yeah. you're eligible. Um, they may need to know, for example, your name and address, maybe your national insurance number, but again, no personal financial information. Mm -hmm. um, if you feel like you're owed state pension compensation, there is a checklist. This is mainly for women who took time off work between 1978 and 2010. Some men can be owed it as well, but there is that
that checklist on the gov.uk website, so you can go on there and have a look. Of course, if you think you've been a victim of one of these scams, one of these fraudulent websites, you can report it to the National Cyber Security Centre. They have a slightly complicated website, but, of course, all of this is going to be on our website. You can check all, yeah. the, all the details you need there. Do you know what? This happened to Karen, actually. I've just seen a message uh, here in the inbox saying, since New Year's Day, I uh, have been receiving up to 10 emails an hour uh, from wow. some not very nice sites, which I have not looked at, not subscribed to. I spent 90 minutes forwarding those I received in one 24-hour period to report at phishing.co.uk. Uh, but it seems the more I report, the more I receive. No. Like, that's interesting. How do you stop that, Nick? So, Karen's probably not going to like my recommendation, but I think this is the best course of action when you've got a spam problem as serious as that. And it's basically just to sacrifice that email address to the god of, of, of spam. So, set up a yeah. new one. Start clean, start fresh. I did this quite recently and put an auto reply on that old email address. So if your friends email you, they'll see an automatic reply that says, I've got a new email address now, it's this one. Like the kind of spam emails you're yeah. getting there, it's automated anyway. So they're not going to be able to steal that and then start using your new one and spamming no, your new one. That's a good idea. Mm. That is but report. Don't forget to report. Yes. That does help other people, doesn't it? Quite uh, you mentioned uh, the website. All those uh, different uh, websites are really, really key. Let's make sure you go into the right place. So we will put them on our website, bbc.co.uk slash morning live. You can trust those and you can have a good look. Thank you, Nick. My pleasure. Uh, now, while scammers are always looking for new ways to steal our cash, we're finding out about a couple in London with a novel way of saving their whole street money. Mm. Climate expert James Stewart has been to discover how they manage to generate their own electricity. Walthamstow in Greater London is one of the city's boroughs most affected by fuel poverty, the inability to heat your home properly. But some residents in this street have seen their bills come down thanks to the efforts of their neighbours. Dan Edelstein and Hilary Powell live here. And just over a year ago, they decided to do something about the way all of these houses get their energy. Dan and Hilary's idea was to turn the whole street into its very own power station. And at the same time, use what they were doing to campaign for investment in local solar projects. So you guys had this amazing dream, this amazing vision, but how did it come about and why did it come about? This started during lockdown and like many other people we found ourselves asking what is the world that we're now living in and we wanted to do something. And there was a phrase in a book, every building a power station. So that kind of idea of what a power station could be if you took it away from fossil fuel burning power to now be every street a power station. So our initial idea was, can we take our street off the grid? So we thought, can we get solar panels for every house on the street? Initially, interest was slow to pick up, but after some door knocking from Hillary and Dan, explaining the benefits, things really started to pick up. Reasons people started to be interested might have been action on climate, but actually more than that on cost of living and energy bills but even more than that, doing something together as a community. So that was the thing that really was the motivating factor, I think. 30 houses decided they wanted to take part, but solar panels still aren't cheap, and not everyone had the same ability to pay. To get this project off the ground, Dan and Hillary knew they needed to lower the cost, and for that, they needed funding to subsidize the panels. So they started fundraising. They tried selling art and growing an online membership site, sharing their journey. But it was one extremely ambitious idea which saw them raise over £100,000 for the street. They slept outdoors on the roof of their house until the money was raised. It took them 23 days. Our goal was always to try and create a story that could be entertaining and make a point at the same time. And it, it was born out of the fact that we knew we had to raise the stakes a bit because what we'd tried up until that point just wasn't yielding the street in terms of bringing people together. There's local food growing cooperatives and then we grew loads of sunflowers over I the summer. That. Yeah, I saw that. And just getting people out and, and meeting each other and realising that we're all, you know, pretty <laughs> similar in yeah. what we want, want and need in life. In full. The difference the solar panels are now making to people's bills is enormous. Are you seeing a reduction in the costs? Uh, 70%. Less? Yeah. Wow, that's so huge. Really has helped me a great deal. I'm a retired old boy. <laughs> I was really struggling. 
and that has helped me a great deal. What Dan and Hillary are doing, do you think that's brought people here closer together? Almost 95% people, whenever they walk, hello, hi, how are you, how are you doing? Wow. All things. And that's, that's what it is, it's community spirit. It's, for me, it's one of the most important things there is in life. So you're a relative newcomer to this particular street? About two, two, three years. So you kind of got, arrived here and then suddenly found out that there were going to be solar panels potentially on the roof. H how did that make you feel when you first heard about it? So lucky. There's this enormous community of people who are already connected, who are organising and can make something like this possible. Put the kettle on in the daytime and this is powered by the sun. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's brilliant. Dan and Hillary's solar panels are just here. Now what they do is convert energy from the sun over there into electricity, which flows down cables in the walls to here, where what they're getting is monitored and topped up if they need it with electricity from the grid. And if they actually make more than they need, electricity-wise, they can put it back in the grid and get paid for it. Michael Cottrell is the director of Zero Bills Homes at Octopus Energy, who Dan and Hillary chose to install the solar panels. Michael, it's, it's incredible seeing all these solar panels down this street, but we live in the UK and I can't help but think, does, is it worth it? Does it work all year round? We're not known for our sunshine. So even today on a fairly gloomy day, the house here is generating power from the solar panels on the roof. What I'm looking at here is an app that shows Dan and Hillary exactly what's happening with the solar panels on their roof. Okay. We think that over the course of the year, the solar panels will generate enough power to meet about half of Dan and Hillary's electricity demand wow. and reduce their bill by about a third. If I was to do this on my own, off my own back, it's quite a big outlay initially to install the solar panels. How do I get around that? Is the answer working with more people like what you guys have done here? I think so. Working with the community has meant that we've been able to reduce the cost for everybody here. And, and hopefully it'll serve as a bit of a template to, to do more work like this in the future. Typically we see uh, that the solar panels pay for themselves um, somewhere between five and 10 years from, from installation. The other thing that I'd say is that the cost of solar panels is coming down, so hopefully will be cheaper for, for everybody um, in the future as well. For Hillary and Dan, this isn't the end of the story. With more houses on their street to source solar panels for, they also have plenty of other plans to make their area even more efficient, including helping local schools benefit from solar power. While the government isn't doing this, we're proposing that other communities should follow the street-by-street -street model that we're putting forward. But I don't think that's really got enough legs for it to happen quick enough yeah. that it really needs to. It's an interim solution. I really think that the, there's so much to be gained from just the, just the social side of it. The camaraderie on the street is something that people are really enjoying. It's amazing what can happen when just a few neighbours come together and so inspiring to see how they've brought community and, dare I say, power to the people. I mean, what an it's impact they've made. so brilliant. On every level. I know. Yeah. I love Staying it. Staying on your roof, though, for 23 days, can you imagine? It's commitment. Yeah. Uh, we're sticking uh, with the topic of trailblazers now. We're leaving Walthamstow uh, and heading to West Wales in Swansea, home of hit BBC drama Men Up. It's been praised for busting the taboo around erectile dysfunction, something half of men over 40 in the UK struggle with. Yeah, the film follows five Welshmen who were part of one of the world's first medical trials for Viagra in the 90s. Nairin Barnard, who plays Dr Delan Pierce, and uh, Paldit Sharma, who plays uh, Pete, uh, one of the guys uh, on the trial in the film. Gents, Borada, lovely to see you. <laughs> yeah, Borada. Borada. <laughs> uh, congratulations on this. It's hugely important. It's it gripping, it's moving. Um, it's a wonderful uh, film. Um, and Nairin, we saw... Your character there, the doctor, Dr. Pierce, uh, he's in charge of this trial, isn't he? Yeah, he kind of he's a consultant at Morriston Hospital um, when we meet him, and he's and he's trying to break kind of the the attitude towards um, um, from um, well not being able to sustain an erection, um, and it was several different reasons for this, and he's trying to. Um, science help these men change their lives really um which is having a huge impact on their personal lives um their every day their confidence their mental health their well-being in general um but there is this magical pill that could change that for them and um 
he's trying to convince the medical community at the time to kind of take it more seriously. And, you know, we're back in 1994 at this point, and attitudes were quite narrow-minded for men. At the, um, and men were struggling, really, to talk about impotence and the struggles that they had. Um, I feel like we've changed a lot, but there's, there's always uh, more room to discover better ways of doing things, I think. Yeah, but as we said, you know, you have been praised for busting the taboo, mm. getting men talking, you know, specifically about the issue of erectile dysfunction. Uh, Pal Duck, it's, it's about men opening up, isn't it? That's the real theme. Getting people talking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I think what uh, Matthew Barry did with the script so beautifully was that he, uh, he was able to, uh, to have a, a, you know, a spoonful of sugar and the medicine go down, really, mm -hmm. and, and have a sense of humour um, uh, around this taboo subject um, and, uh, and to deal with something serious but uh, with, in, in, a light, in a light format, you know, um, which I think uh, the, the, the show does really well. Mm. And it's had the most amazing reaction, hasn't it, and response. Like, it's, it's working, it's getting people talking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as Anir said, I think there has been improvement in that area. And um, this is yet, <laughs> and, uh, um, as, as storytelling can do, it's just another way to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to um, you know, uh, endorse that mm. and promote it a bit more. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, yeah, men, men are doing a lot better than than we were, you know? Yeah. And, uh, uh, as, as he says, it's room for improvement. Uh, mm. the, the scene we just saw there in the pub, actually, it's your character, Pete, that, that says to the other lads, look, it's amazing that, that we're, we're talking about this. I can see Dr Poonam is with us this morning, guys, yeah. uh, nodding their head there. I mean, is that something you find, like, men not willing to open up about these problems they may have? You know, it also talk about diabetes in the show as well. It's yeah. not always, you know, someone's yeah. fault, is it? Oh, it's a fantastic show, and I think it really does shine a spotlight. And although we have come a very long way from the 90s, I still feel that today men do struggle to come forward. And, you know, a huge proportion of the GP workforce is made up of female GPs, and I think sometimes that can be seen as a barrier. But there are so many different causes for why men can experience erectile dysfunction. As we say, it's over half of men over the age of 40 will mm. experience it. So you shouldn't feel any shame. Shame. Getting to the root cause of the problem is key to all elements of your health and well-being, but also for your relationships. Mm. If you um, if you are a guy though, that go into see a GP, you can ask for a male GP if you're absolutely. more comfortable. Absolutely, you absolutely yeah. can do. Yes, just yeah. say, you know I'd feel more comfortable seeing a male GP. That's not a problem. But equally, you know, we see everything, uh, and we're more than happy for people to come forward yeah. and yeah. speak. Yeah. And the more the more people talk about it, the easier that gets, doesn't it? Uh, now. I know that a lot of you have actually worked together before on Gavin and Stacey. Obviously, uh, we saw you as Ahmed, um, <laughs> Joanna Page's ex. <laughs> but apparently, is this true? You've not actually, you didn't meet on Gavin and Stacey. This is the first time you've met filming this. Yeah, yeah. At the read through, she came up to me and she said, I'm sorry I didn't marry you. I was <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> That's so funny that you can work. So that long? <laughs> <laughs> oh, These two have been so different. different. Yeah. So different. <laughs> we're um, we we're all mates. We're all mates from that part of the world. I mean, I haven't seen <laughs> yeah. Anaerin for what? Maybe maybe it's two decades now. Anaerin, I'm not sure you're going to. Thank me for showing a few of these uh, oh, no. pictures. But uh, I used to host a show oh, on S4C with Gethin, Alex Jones. You have not. <laughs> <laughs> I used to host a show called Pop Do with Alex Jones. Oh, wow. Uh, back wow. in the day. And Anaerin was a brilliant <laughs> solo performer. And I think this, look, as you can see in the mayhem there, I think we're interviewing you there. It's uh, myself, Alex, I think we're going to see Fionn, and, and there he is in the white top. Oh, wow, wow look at that. <laughs> what a blast from the past. Oh, Gethin, I can't wait to see you. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> a, oh I, I don't well. think I've ever seen... Oh, my gosh. <gasps> oh, is that you, Gethin? That's me and Fionn, yeah. My goodness. Wow. Two decades ago, that and Erin. You still do a bit of singing? Not for anyone but myself. <laughs> <laughs> that image of you there, did you not have... Um, 
Was there no wardrobe to iron your shirt? <laughs> <laughs> that is that is serious. They that, call that like, they call that fashion. I was going to say that's a real well, real man. fashion choice. Uh, well, the film <laughs> is absolutely it's brilliant. brilliant. Guys, congrats, it really is, yeah. and so so important. So thanks for coming on and chatting to us. And you can watch Men Up on iPlayer right now. It's superb indeed. Yeah, uh, that was the fashion back then. Don't it was, wasn't it? That like crinkly thing. Yeah, yeah we'll let you off on that one. <laughs> just, just. I'm sure I'm going to get a text from Alex Jones any minute now as well. <laughs> yes. I know all this week we've been surprising Strictly Fitness with some very special guests. Uh, we're still doing our minute of exercise per day, but spicing it up with a gladiator-inspired power move and finding out a bit more about their new Saturday Night Superhumans. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Rick. It's hard to hold the face when you laugh. Yeah. Today I'm joined by the man, the myth, the legend in this studio. And it's about time we get to know our gladiator. So, Legend, welcome. Um, with just a few questions. Firstly, I mean, the name Legend, how did you even come up with that? Tell us. The BBC basically said that the most attractive gladiator of all time is too long a name, so we set up a legend. Wow, yeah, and I don't know why that wouldn't work on a textbook or something, so that totally makes sense to us. Uh, also, I mean, you've had quite a few accomplishments, you know, millions of followers, best-selling books. Uh, what what there's encouraged... More, there's more, you can go on. There's... I, I, I know, but then the show would have to go on for an hour and 40, That's so it. we have to keep it slow. Uh, but what, what inspired you to become a gladiator, then? I just felt it was the right thing to do. I felt like it wouldn't be fair to deprive the public of this, essentially. <laughs> in the same way that the Mona Lisa, imagine that being you know, kept in someone's <laughs> basement somewhere. You know, it's not fair, is it? I think people should get to... Well, uh, I speak on behalf of all of us when I say thank you for your sacrifice. You're welcome. <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, and one thing that I think many people wouldn't, would be surprised to know because of things like your personality, but it's that you used to be a PE teacher. Um, so how does that work with being a gladiator? Are there any crossovers? Actually, it was quite a useful experience in the sense that Ability-wise, for me, the contenders were akin to children, so it did stand me in good stead in that sense, just dealing with small, annoying people. <gasps> right, yeah, obviously. I mean, again, I've got to just say, the, the, the kind of humility that you give off is really inspiring I to me. I do get that a lot. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. And, and we're going to be looking at some of your gladiator moves. Uh, we're going to be doing the lunges based on uh, the move, well, the game, Collision. So what is it that you need to be good at this game? So as a contender, an important skill is the ability to dodge. So like we're going to go for like a side lunge. Essentially, you're going down here with the with the intention of dodging me swinging across. Right. Disclaimer: It's pointless because you don't. No one dodges me. It doesn't no, happen. No one but dodges me. You can try. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well then, let's try together, everyone. So you're gonna how it's gonna work at the end of the show. So we're gonna stand, get a good stance, and then you're gonna lunge to the side like so. That's. And Straight away, that's, you want to get flat foot. That was bad. Do that, that again. Was... Do that, do it again. <laughs> so I, to the... Better, better. Yeah, yeah, OK, great. And then you're going to go to the other side. How's, how's that? It's like a four out of ten. Right, OK. Well, we've got time to work our way back up there. So get practising. Like I said, limber up. It is for everyone. Ignore what he's saying. Just look at me. Uh, and we'll see you then. Well, <laughs> just... In case anyone hasn't worked out, I think Legend is definitely the baddie. Do you think? The new wolf. <laughs> but I am I'm determined to get this guy smiling by the end of the show. I'm going to do whatever it takes. Uh, keep practising and we will put that balancing move with all the other moves that we've learnt this week at the end of the show. And we might even see what Reese is wearing underneath that track. Oh, no. The reveal. Lovely. A big reveal is on its uh, way. Can you confirm or deny the fact you tried tickling Legend when you walked into the studio? <laughs> I already tried. Yeah, didn't, I didn't get a smile, but I got him. a smirk. We're getting there. Work in progress. We're getting there. Uh, coming up in about 10 minutes, we're tackling one of the biggest issues facing a fifth of UK homes right now. That's mould. We'll explain how to prevent it. First, though, the number of people becoming new pet owners is on the episode of Dr. James Greenwood is answering your questions. And we have a few, Yeah, don't we've we? got loads. Let's get straight into brilliant. it. So brilliant, Gina brilliant. has got in touch and she said, I recently got a cat mm -hmm. over Christmas. Exciting. She's been reading online about cheaper alternatives for litter, such as sawdust, paper. She says, will my cat who's always used the same tray actually use these okay so 
Cat litter, it's one of those things where it always ends up in the bin at some point. So it's kind <laughs> it's of one of those things. Just when does that happen? You yeah. just sort of, it's frustrating, but it is, it, is, it is necessary. And cats are very particular about where they want to go to the toilet and, and what type of substrate they want to go in as well. Yeah. So, yes, some of the cheaper alternatives there are out there, but you've got to kind of take a few things into account. So paper, for example, would be quite smelly, you know, once they've used mm. it. You might be able to find something that's biodegradable, something that's odourless. Um, there's all sorts of different things, things to think about how you store it, uh, but also think about where the tray is as well. So, you know, where the tray is in the house will make a big difference Makes whether difference, the cat uses yeah. it. So, a low traffic area, you know, keeping it away from doors, keep it away from their food and water. Um, and also, you know, it's, it's about coming up with something that's going to work long term. So, a clumping litter, for example, it might look more expensive on the bag, but the point of that is that it will clump around any waste. So, you only have to remove that rather than the entire tray. So, it can actually save you money in the long term so yes there are some alternatives but make sure it's pet safe and just make sure it's going to actually be practical for you to use that's as a well. good point though that is a really mm. good point the uh, how long have you been a vet <laughs> i've been a vet for 15 years Gethin. in that 15 years what's the best name you've ever heard for a dog <laughs> <laughs> i'm with him on this i'm gonna say well you know i love uh, mr bumble will always stick out for me <laughs> so mr bumble's good <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> wendy's got a dog called beryl I love that's Beryl. Just the best name. I knew you were going to say that. Beryl. Look at oh, Beryl. Beryl. She says Beryl is a bit overweight. She's a Springer Spaniel, and every day we'll walk her in the morning and evening, um, Wendy says. Uh, is winter weight a real thing? Okay, she is gorgeous. Look, Beryl. Um, so, winter weight, it's something that I, it's hard to know whether that's a, a real thing or whether it's a result of the fact that we're all a bit more kind of, you know, indoorsy in yeah. the winter, isn't it? The point is, is that no matter when dogs put weight on, it's important that we recognise it and do something about it. Nearly half of our pets in the UK are overweight, so it is a problem that we are really mm. seeing. Now, the first thing to do is recognise that there's a problem, and there is something that you can do at home called a body condition score, which is something all pet owners can do, and it's really easy to do as well. So what you would initially do is... I'll show you on Dolly. You would... You're a bit gutted she's not in her bed now, aren't you? I know. Yeah. <laughs> she's so, oh, doll, come on now. Look, so we're going to run our... <laughs> no. we're gonna, she's so, so ridiculous. We're going to run our hands <laughs> down her ribs. So ideally what you want to do is feel the ribs really easily, but you don't want to see them. So the body condition score is scored out of nine. And you want yeah. something pretty much in the middle. So you can run your hands on the back. Then you run down the spine and you want to be able to feel her spine really easily and her hip bones really easily. Um, and then lastly, you have a look just, from the was top it, as Just well. the spine again. Was this to show us down so the back, was So you just run, it, yeah. run your hand yeah, down her spine. She's enjoying it, though. <laughs> yeah, she's she's just, she's, this is the problem. Come on, up you get. So you would then run your, run your hand down the back, basically, and feel all the spine and feel the, hip, feel the hips. And then lastly, you want to have a look from the down. Look, look over them, basically. So bird's eye view down on top. Uh -huh. And you want to see a nice tucked in waist so you can sort of see um, there's there's a nice tucked in waist and then when you look from the side as well it's sort of tucked up into the tummy uh -huh. so those those are the ways to tell and you grade that out of nine um, and then that will tell you if they're a bit right. overweight or not. And then if they are a bit overweight, lots of things you can do. Be careful of portion size, treats, make sure you switch treats out to something lower calorie. And then also mm -hmm. think about how we feed them. Ditch the dog bowl. Use things like puzzle feeders, stuffed Kongs, ways that you can really kind of make them work for their food. Because really? that really helps them to feel just that little bit more satisfied. Yeah, and, you know, and it, it is can, a it can, reward, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. So they probably love it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question from Luke. So he says, him and his partner have wanted a dog for years. Neither of them have ever owned a dog but their parents have said that they will help them home a puppy. Oh. But what, what do they need to do to prepare? Oh, my gosh, big news, it isn't that? It's a, a big, big deal, change. Right? Yeah, yeah, it is. And I think that's the thing, you know, having a puppy, it's a lifelong commitment. So I would say, to start with, do your research on the breeder. If you haven't got the puppy yet, if you're not going to go through a rescue centre, if you're going to find a, a breeder, do your research. Make sure you see the puppy with the mother. Make sure you see them suckling. Uh, make sure there's a puppy contract as well. Yeah. And then all sorts of different things there. So uh, think about where your puppy's going to eat, sleep, toilet, play, those sorts of things. And then sort of map that out in your house. Mm -hmm. And I think the, big, the best thing to do with a puppy is to almost work out how you'd like them to be as an adult dog, to make that sort of start from the beginning. So the temptation Put is to the pick them up and cuddle them, but actually you want to kind of think, well, I, I don't want him on the sofa, so I'm not going to have the puppy on the sofa. <laughs> it's a bit like you know, babies, I made all the wrong really choices. Really <laughs> it's really similar, really similar. Then you've got to go back and retrain them. So, exactly. Yeah, good advice, guys, good advice. <laughs> exactly. Things like baby gates, again, work really well on stairs. Pup stairs are particularly dangerous for puppies as well. So, yeah. you know, making sure that they can't run up and down the stairs. Um, 
the crate training, I mean, I'm quite a huge fan of crates, but again, you need to introduce that slowly and positively, but it can really help them feel safe, have a little den that's they their own place. They want to go there, exactly. yeah. Exactly. Um, and also, do invest. You know, it, it is another expense, but I would really say invest in some really good puppy training. Team up with a trainer or a, or a behaviorist, or even some of the dog charities offer some really affordable online mm. courses as well, just to get all that knowledge and you can put it into place. Really, what you want to do with the puppy is set them up for success. You want to give them those tools that they can then grow up into really nice, well-rounded, well-paved like dogs. Start them early, then. Quickly. Exactly. Yeah. Start from the day you get them. OK. Mm. Uh, a quick question on uh, vaccines mm. with, with, with cats, uh, if that's all right. Lisa's uh, worried about her cat, Lola. Uh, she thinks... Uh, she's heard there's going to be a shortage of vaccines for... <laughs> Look at that. Lola's in exactly the same position Lola. as Dolly right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> got some um, very sleepy pets. <laughs> what's the latest on, on that? What can you tell us about vaccines? Yeah, so we have seen, with all sort of the changes with the... Sort of supply and chains and things like that. Some of the wholesalers have said that we've struggled to get some vaccines through 2023. The point is, we have always got options. So it might be that your vets need to switch brand to a different brand of vaccination, or sometimes you have got a little bit of extra leeway with some of the vaccinations. So that once they're sort of once they're due, you might be able to go overdue by a, a number of months, depending on that vaccine, and it, the, the cat will still have the protection of that of that vaccine from last year. So lots of options. It, I can't say it's not going to happen, but there should always be a solution to it. So. Keep, it, keep talking to vets, you know, vets will communicate with you because if it's happening to you, it's happening to all of their clients as well. So there will be solutions. All right. Good to know there's always a solution, isn't it? Uh, well, still to come on the show, uh, the cold weather means heart attacks are actually twice as likely at this time of year. In around 10 minutes, we explain how doing squats while brushing your teeth uh, or waiting for the kettle to boil can reduce your risk. I'm definitely yeah. going to try it. The, the squat thing, a lot of people are reluctant to do it, but apparently it really works, as Dr yeah. Finn will explain. And the thing that's apparently captured all of our hearts is the uh, potato. The potato. It's the nation's <laughs> favourite vegetable. In 20 minutes, we'll find out how red skin spuds are best for making chips. Oh, they are. Uh, plus, we're showing you how you could make a few hundred quid from things you have lying around your house uh, with upcycling expert Joey. J Zoe Pocock, you know I love a little bit. Uh, Zoe, show us your boots. Show us your boots. She got these online. Over Look at those. Wow. For a bargain. They she are. knows her stuff. More from Zoe in just a second. Snazzy. Uh, but first, uh, time for us to take a look at our story of the day, the pick of the papers. And uh, James, it's one that's actually caught your eye. This is a story that will, will literally at the start, your, your heart broke. If you're a pet owner, it's the last thing you want to happen. Yeah. Uh, explain what you've seen. So this story caught my eye immediately. It's heartbreaking to even think about it, mm. but it's a real story of hope. It's a beautiful Hungarian Vizsla, Y-head Vizsla, uh, called Ulis, and he unfortunately oh. went missing. Look at him there. <laughs> <laughs> he went missing on the 20th of December, which I think every dog owner can immediately just think, it's your worst nightmare. It's your worst nightmare, yeah. Anyway, after a lot of searching over in the area in Bedfordshire... 12 um, days, wasn't it? 12 days later on Sunday, thank you to a drone, thanks to the work of a drone, we managed to find him. So I just oh, saw wow. this story and just thought, do you know what? It's so, the worst like an infra, This is the infrared drone, so you can see the white spot. Exactly. So it's a thermal camera that they can send up on the wow. drone, and then that has managed to locate where he is. Turns out he was hiding in a hedge. Um, and, you know, you, you, to, to find that just, you know, as, as people would be so difficult, but it's, you know, to be, able to, to be able to find it. And then look here, so this is the actual moment that we got reunited, that the owners got reunited with Ulis. And look, he's just sort of, he'd, I, I understand he got trapped there and couldn't get, couldn't get out, so couldn't respond to any of the, the calls and, and sort of, you know, well, any, any sort of encouragement yeah. to come back to his owners. What a moment. So without the drone, I just don't think that we would have perhaps ever been reunited. So it's, it's a real amazing, amazing story. Totally incredible. And we're really pleased to say that his owner, Sam Boyle, is actually with us this morning. And I'm really hoping Ulis is there too. Ah. Yes! Yay! <laughs> oh, lovely to see you both. <laughs> oh, they're back together! <laughs> um, I can't only imagine how heartbreaking that time was. 12 days is so long to be apart. Horrendous, all over Christmas, and to, to not know what happened to him was just the worst thing. Yeah. So you had been searching, and is it is it right that you'd actually searched in the location where you eventually found him? Yeah, and the, the day, the um, second day, first day, second day, uh, we walked that road, but unfortunately, because he'd got so wrapped up in his um, retractable lead, 
in the hedgerow um, and it was on the other side of the road, so within the field, um, there was no way we would have seen it. Yes. Um, so who's brilliant? He was making any noise, so we just didn't know, but we, we walked that road on the Wednesday and the Thursday. Oh. Um, there was nothing, no noise at all. So Sam, who's brilliant idea? <laughs> yeah, whose brilliant idea was it to get a drone? Genius. I have, I, I can't remember, to be honest. Somebody must have mentioned it, and within a few hours, I remember sitting in the car trying to get a hold of this drone company, a charity, um, and they took all the details, and because of how Elisa bolted, and the belief is that a dog will come back within 48 hours, they'll find their own way home. Um, obviously, he had the, the lead on it, so that was the massive worry. But I didn't want to think about about whether he was stuck. Um, mm. And obviously, after two days, there, there was no sightings. After 10 days, there were no sightings. So it was a case that uh, a friend put me in touch with a company called Canine Capture. And uh, they plotted where Ulysse should have ended up. Um, and they were literally really quite spot on with the field that he was in. Uh, and then the thermal drone um, <laughs> came out on New Year's Eve, and within four hours, uh, he was found. You know, um, you do what we do with Dolly when she wants to have a sleep mid-morning. We try and wake her up for telly, and you're doing a great job. Because oh. Ulysses has been through a lot and just wants to have a little bit of a kip. I, I, I can't imagine you want to let go at the moment, though, after everything that's, that, that's happened. What was that moment like when you were reunited after, what, almost two weeks apart? I just couldn't believe that, that we'd found him um, and that <laughs> from drone to home that... Um, he ran because we were searching out buildings while he was flying the drone and um, he said we've got him on the camera and it was just well I just couldn't believe it I just stupidly said is he alive oh. obviously if he wasn't alive then they wouldn't have picked up his mm. heat source in the head drone um, and you know they warned me that he was very skinny and I had to walk up very quietly and just sit down and talk to him. Yeah. No. And then within about a minute, he kind of... It, he came his around. His face yeah. and with, um, um, it, He realised it was me. It's amazing, oh. amazing seeing that moment <laughs> together. Thank you for joining us. So we'll let him get some rest after everything he's been through. Thanks for joining us on Morning Live uh, uh, this morning. Thank just you, Thank you, Sam. An incredible story and such a happy ending, James. Uh, the drone... It's really emotional. I just love dogs. It's yeah, great. Great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you expect them to do? Um, it's the drone's brilliant, obviously. But yeah. what, um, if you don't have that, what would you do if you if you lose a, a pet, an animal? What would you do? Well, I think I think this is it. You you immediately feel so helpless and you yeah. can panic. But actually, technology is incredible at how it can help us in these situations. Do go online. There are some incredible charities and Facebook groups set up dedicated to finding lost dogs. So do enlist the help of those guys. Social media is a really powerful yeah. tool, you know, it, just getting the word out there. One, of, one thing that people tend to do is, is try and send out a search party, but actually if your dog has spooked and run, that can actually keep frightening them further and further away. So try not to panic, enlist the help, get clever basically. And if you have yeah. got access to drones, even better. Yeah. But don't forget a tag, you know, a legal, yeah. a legal requirement is to wear yeah. a tag with your name and address and things like that, mm. which is an immediate way of getting in contact with you as well. Yeah, that's so brilliant, isn't don't it? overlook it. Great that you oh. is home. There's a lot of sense of community on the, the show today. Lots people helping each other yeah. out. Brilliant. Great ending. Oh, uh, now then, we've talked about mould on the show before. We know it can cause so much misery for, for people, especially in the winter when the cold, damp weather makes it even worse, doesn't it? It does. It really does. Interiors expert Jackie Joseph has been to investigate the massive impact it can have on people's lives and how to get to the root of the problem. Britain's a wet and humid place to live, and that's something which enables mould to thrive in our homes. And knowing the best way to deal with that mould can be confusing, but it is important that we do. Because not only can it be problematic for our homes, but it can also damage our health. It's something that Stacey Coveley is critically aware of. I sleep here, everything, my clothes are there, my daughter's clothes are there, because I can't put them in the wardrobe, because the wardrobe is like the, it's like the damper mould is embedded in my wardrobe, it stinks. 
Stacy's doctors believe that the damp and mould in her property is likely to be exacerbating her COPD. What sort of impact is the exposure to the mould having on your health? She suffers with continuous bouts of conjunctivitis. My son has febrile seizures, so I moved him out five years ago for the sake of his health. So your, your son doesn't live with you? He, li he lives with my sister. Oh, wow. Yeah, it breaks my heart. So I'll be honest with you, I cry myself to sleep most nights just because I've never had both my kids living under the same roof. I mean, she's only a year old, so they've never lived together. Stacey's property is owned by her local council. She became aware of the seriousness of the issue and contacted them in 2021. They took nine months to renovate the property, moving Stacey out, which was a very welcome break from living with mould. My health got so much better. I, did, I saw a doctor once in nine months. I see my doctor every three or four months at the moment when I'm here. And so then when you moved back in, you, you all moved back in once they had yeah. done what they said they were going to do yeah. and everything was fine? It was for about three months and I started to slowly notice all the brown water dripping in on the boxing up here. I noticed bits of damp coming in around the windows and that's when I realised that they didn't treat it at all. They covered it up. If there's one thing I know about mould is that you can't just cover it up. It needs careful treatment. Otherwise, in some circumstances, it can be life-changing. In 2022, an inquest found that two-year-old Awab Ishak died as a result of a severe respiratory condition caused by prolonged exposure to mould in his home. It became heartbreakingly clear how big a problem mould is if it's left untreated. So it's understandable that Stacey is so worried about this issue. But many of us are still left wondering what exactly mould is and the risks of being exposed to it. Dr. Hector Altamirano is an associate professor and building scientist at UCL. For me, mold is in some way a messenger because mold, if it's growing in a home, is telling you that it's an excess of moisture. Mold are living organisms that play an extremely important role on breaking down the uh, organic material like leaves and our ravage. Without mold, we wouldn't be able to survive in this world. If it grows in surfaces in a large extent inside your homes, they may affect your health and could be your physical health, but also your mental health. They're incredible organisms, but not nice to share your home with. Professor Michael Perrette's job is to get rid of mould from homes. He's a building pathologist. Why are you so passionate about it? I'm passionate about it because I came into public housing all those years ago to try and make a measurable difference to the conditions in which people live. I think one of the other main drivers for me is to spread knowledge. We've come to a house owned by Richard. He rents the property out, but needs Michael's expert help to find the source of his mould malaise. With his help, we'll be treating the mould there right now, but also trying to understand what's causing it. Richard initially thought it was a leaky pipe. We fixed the leaking pipe and that dried out during the course of the renovations and it looked fine. And then how long afterwards, you said the tenants only left a couple of weeks ago, how long after since they moved in did they tell you about Probably this Probably in midsummer, so three months after moving in. Oh wow. Yeah, so to hear that there were damp problems was, was a real surprise. With Michael's preliminary checks completed, it's time to find out what's causing the mould in this house. Ah, oh, Michael, thank you so much for taking a look at that damp patch. So what were your findings? Well, we are standing on a timber suspended floor here, abutting a solid ground supported floor right. yes. in the back. The difficulty is the damp proof membrane in the solid floor cannot be properly interleafed with the damp proof course in the wall. As we get intense rainfall periods, the water table is pushing up and that is being squeezed between the edge of the floor slab and the wall. As usual, mould is almost always caused by too much moisture. To reduce this, you could try a dehumidifier to extract some of that moist air in the room. And as for the stuff that's already here, don't be tempted to just bleach it. That only hides the mould. 
you want the type of cleaners that have got the active ingredient of sodium hydroxide. So you need to check the label on the back. So what can we do to limit the impact of mould within our homes? Well, it's all about the control of moisture. There are so many things that individuals can do themselves. Wiping the excess moisture off the bedroom windows during a cold winter's morning, squeegeeing down the tiled wall surfaces, covering pots where you're boiling water with lids. No one should be living with regular mould in their home, but if you are, don't suffer in silence. Something can be done about it, but you've got to find the source. If you already have a problem with mould within the home, wiping it away alone will not fix the issue. You need to get to the bottom of the cause of that imbalance and fix that. Because as we know, having mould within the home could be detrimental to our health and that makes it all the more important to eradicate it from our homes. Yeah, as you just said, like it's so easy sometimes with those things to put them off, mm. but it's majorly serious. Like it can have, you know, massive impact on our health, can't it? Yeah, absolutely. And it's insidious the way that mould does it. And it affects every part of your, your body, your health, yeah. but particularly when it comes to respiratory conditions can land you up Creeps in hospital. Up so I would say do not ignore it. Definitely no. address it sooner rather than later. Especially as this weather's getting worse and worse. It's cold and damp as well. It also mm. affects us in many different ways, our bodies in different ways. We're talking about heart health, aren't we, going into the winter yeah. uh, months. Um, why is it worse in winter? What's going on? There's a few reasons for why our heart to health is more important at this time of year. Now, if we think about it, we've just come out of the festive period, but during these months, people's mental health can really suffer. There might be high levels of stress and anxiety, which can impact your heart. Over this period of time, we are more likely to change the way that we eat. So you yes, could be having more <laughs> comfort, indulgent foods. We might be drinking more alcohol. Um, and alongside that, you know, you've got those things, but when it's cold, you're less likely to want to go out and exercise mm. and you adopt a more sedentary lifestyle. Last week I was chatting all about vitamin D and we said that 60% mm. of adults in the UK are deficient in vitamin D, which is very important for your heart health. But earlier in the show we were talking about the fact that the cold weather is about to get colder yeah. next week. Yes. Um, but people don't assume that Research has shown us time and time again that actually you're twice as more likely to have a heart attack or a stroke when the weather is colder, really? particularly yeah. if you're over the age of 60 um, and if you've got pre-existing heart conditions. Okay, but what do those freezing temperatures actually do to our heart? Yeah. Okay, so I think if we go back to the very basics. Yeah. Our heart is fantastic at adapting. Keep to it basic our... for me. No, no, it's important. <laughs> no, it's so important. And it, it, our heart is constantly working to adapt to our environments. So, for example, when you're exercising, your heart will work harder, it will pump faster and with more force in order to get blood to the muscles that are working harder. So the blood vessels in those areas will dilate to get more oxygen there. Mm -hmm. When the temperature drops and it gets colder, our blood vessels, particularly in the extreme so your hands and your feet, they will end up narrowing and shrinking. We call this vasoconstriction. And it does this in order to keep our core temperature up and it provides oxygen then to things like your brain, mm -hmm. your gut, the vital organs. But in this, in this response, what happens is your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up. And if this is over a long period of time, you know, cost of living crisis, homes are not yeah. heated, insulation issues, you can actually end up with problems like a heart attack or a stroke developing. In the cold, your blood is more likely to get sticky, it can clot, so again, increase your risk of strokes. Yeah. So I'm saying that, you know, a lot of people that have got angina for example, might feel that their symptoms get worse when they're out having a simple walk. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be exercising. Mm -hmm. It just means layer up, stay warm, and of course you can exercise indoors. Yeah. Mm. So true. what's the advice for, for, for keeping our heart in, in, in check during the winter months yeah. then? There's definitely lots of things that you can do. The first I said, you know, was mental health yeah. stress levels. So it's important to address that. If you are somebody who's struggling with anxiety um, or, or stress and speak to someone like your GP, mm -hmm. your diet, you know, I know we talk about it here all the time, but you cannot underestimate how important a healthy, balanced diet is. Moderate alcohol, it's the beginning of the year, now's the time to look at it, no yeah. more than 14 units a week. When it is cold, I know that 
that I tend to do, you tend to lean for the hot cups of tea and mm. coffee. Yeah. Try and switch to decaf because caffeine is a stimulant and too many cups of tea and coffee can certainly not be good for your heart. Smoking is another one. Yeah. Again, beginning of the year, now's the time. Speak to your pharmacy or your doctor if you are somebody who wants to cut down and stop. Mm -hmm. Vitamin D, we're always banging on vitamin about. Vitamin D, have you mentioned vitamin D? <laughs> I haven't mentioned vitamin D, I should set it up as a ringtone. Yeah, <laughs> should, yeah, like a voice note. <laughs> Your 10 micrograms of vitamin D. It's so important. It's yeah, so yeah. important. It's the one thing that really, really do it. Um, and I think that the other thing that people might not know is if you've got a family history of heart disease, maybe you're over the mm. age of 40, on the NHS we offer free NHS health checks. So in that, yes. with your practice nurse or your GP, we would go through your history, we'd identify any risk factors, we'd check your blood pressure, we'd do bloods, for example, looking at cholesterol um, and your sugar levels. All these things are very important, so you can book in for that and, of course, exercise. I should say, George, you should do that as well. I'm just seeing the inbox, there's George saying, asking that question. He says, my mum and dad both had heart attacks and my dad had uh, stroke so yeah it can, it's worth getting that checked Absolutely. out Absolutely, yeah. that yeah. peace of mind as well yeah. just That's knowing prevention so is better than cure Speaking of exercise, though, yeah. you've got a little tip for us, haven't you? How to squeeze it in without even realising you're doing without it. Even, really. And that's the beauty of it, that's right? That's the key, isn't it? Tell us. Yes, yeah, so we know that all exercise is good for every bit of you, but particularly when it comes to your heart. But studies and research has shown that actually isometric exercises are better at lowering your blood pressure. Now, mm. what is that, do you ask? <laughs> I do indeed. <laughs> so it's something like a wall squat. So you're against a wall oh. and you're basically just going to a seated position or a plank. And it's Come on, right, up go you on, get on, get on, get on. So for <laughs> the duration of this, you're going to do this. It's legend watching this. It's legend watching this. Legend watching watching it. it's legend legend. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. sure a legend could do this. Oh, goodness. Oh, I could do this. Right, you get into the squat and you hold a plank. What I do with my kids is when we're brushing our teeth in the mornings, we will either do as many squats as we can in two minutes yeah. or do a wall squat. Oh, and hard, the idea though. is... That it... is, he, is he still watching? Is he still watching? It doesn't, it doesn't look that impressed. It doesn't look that impressed. <laughs> Maybe we should impressed. stop. OK. Stop. But what, what, so the evidence shows that actually this is much better at reducing your blood pressure than, say, doing a HIIT workout. By all means, you can do all those other exercises, but you can squeeze well, this in when yeah. you're waiting for the kettle to boil, when you're I've cooking. I've been missing a trick. I'm going to do so, this. So when you are brushing your teeth, it's worth trying to do a few squats, and that will yeah, absolutely help. A few squats help. are just against the wall. Go down for as long as you can. Do it with your kids if you can. It's weaving those but little go. habits in when you don't even know you're doing it. Yeah. Love that. Love and that. of course, every day on the show, we get our minute of exercise in. We always talk about how important Strictly yeah. Fitness is. All this week, it's been a bit of a uh, mashup of uh, Strictly Fitness with a gladiator. You still look at me funny after that <laughs> plank. Uh, we'll see <laughs> Reese. can't breathe. <laughs> and one of the stars of Saturday night. There is legend. <laughs> we think he might be the baddie. Mm. And we'll see them at the end. Of, don't touch him, Reese. We'll see them at the end of the Sorry. show. Sorry. <laughs> we will indeed. Now, uh, talking of mashups, uh, we're talking about the nation's favourite vegetable now, the humble potato. They are cheap, filling, and you can buy them all year round. Yeah, but with lots of uh, varieties, it can be hard to choose the perfect spud. So, Michelin trained chef and self proclaimed potato queen, I think she's overqualified for this, <laughs> but here's Poppy O'Toole. The humble potato is officially the UK's favourite vegetable, with each of us eating over one and a half kilograms of the things every month. Potatoes are so versatile. You can use them for so many things. You can do roasting, mashing, uh, wedges, stews, even in bread. The list is almost endless. But with around 500 varieties in the UK alone, it can be really difficult picking the right ones for your meal. Potatoes contain a starch called amylose, and how much starch is in a potato determines which potato you will need. There are two main types of potato. First up, the floury ones. Look at this lovely fluffy jacket. Flowery potatoes are also really good for mash and roasting too. That's because they contain loads of starch and when you cook them, the starch grows and bursts, making them super fluffy. The most popular in the UK are the King Edwards and the nation's favourite, the Maris Piper. I love both and they're normally available all year round from anywhere, but the King Edwards is really great for roasting or making into chips because it holds its shape but also has a lovely fluffy centre. But if you're just not sure which is which and just want the best all-rounder, the answer is simple and not one you might have tried before. 
A good middle ground is the red skin potato. They have enough starch in them to do a really good mash, but they're also really good at getting crisp as well. So good for your chips, good for your roasties. In the UK, we abandon about 4.4 million potatoes every day. What a waste. But if you store them correctly, they can keep for months before you use them. Don't put them in the fridge. The cold can affect how they cook and how they taste. They can also oxidise whilst they're in here, which means they go all black and horrible. And the wet can make them liquefy. <clears throat> Avoid putting them in your fruit basket too. When certain fruits start ripening, they can let off a gas called ethylene and that can cause your potatoes to start sprouting. Do put them in a cool, dry, dark space. A bottom cupboard in your kitchen is ideal, especially if it's not near an outside wall and you'll find that they last a lot longer. Hopefully now, not only will your potatoes last longer, but they might work better in your meals as well. I'm so glad we've done that. We're constantly <laughs> talking about what is the best for what. So we, we now work for chips, for mash. Why are you laughing at me? You're going to about roast potatoes. Now you know. And if in doubt, go Maris Piper. It's just remembering that's the problem for me. Yeah, uh, anyway, right now, we're talking about how to make money from absolutely anything. Uh, with the recent news that online marketplaces like eBay and Vinted will share how much you've earned with HMRC, upcycling expert Zoe Pocock has a foolproof guide to making some extra cash at home. And this is really exciting, isn't mm. it? But what are the new rules first? Let's just, let's cover that. OK, so let's clear up a uh, misconception at the moment. There are no new rules. Okay. They've always been in place. Um, but there's a new policy. OK, new policy. A new policy Great. where That's HMRC enough. are asking selling platforms like Vinted, eBay, Etsy, to inform them of anyone earning over a thousand pounds. Now, this is the important part. This is aimed at traders. And so only applies to traders. Only applies okay. to traders. So if you've started that side hustle, you've been um, purchasing, manufacturing, making products and uh -huh. reselling, you are considered a trader. Okay. So you must, after a thousand pounds, register yourself as a business. Now you are only taxed on your profits, also, but this is very important. Like if you're like me at the weekend, I sold lots of my clothes out of the cupboard on Vinted, made four hundred pounds. Amazing. It's absolutely fine. So if you're selling personal items, you are okay. okay. That's really good. Um, yeah. For instance, as well, if you're on Universal Credit. Um, you have got £2,500 allowance after your expenses. Okay. So it won't, you know, it won't affect you unless you earn over £2,000. Yeah, and what great. a good time to do it, have that January clear out that's and try and make yeah. a few hundred quid. Rules great, are a bit confusing, it? but but you really can make some money from nothing then. What, what are the best things to, to, to buy and sell in your experience? Um, so personally, I've made money from sardine tins. What? From buttons, <laughs> what? Oh, from buttons. things that people chuck away. So I would suggest if you wanted to start something, you wanted to start that side hustle, that upcycling idea, look for free items on your Facebook, local Facebook group somewhere mm. near to you. Um, people leave out stuff outside their houses, but please do check. Yes. They're not moving uh, in yes. or something. <laughs> mm. um, and yeah, Surplus. I like surplus items in charity shops. So at the moment, I'm working with figurines. Oh. You know, those old fashioned, no one wants figurines. You see a lot of them. I take them home, I clean them, I spray them, give them a little handbag or something quirky, mm -hmm. resell them. So, mm. you know, you can start at any level. Obviously, think about things like space at home. You might not have the space to yes, hold furniture. Yeah, realistic there, haven't or you? Or big pieces, big items. But start small, enjoy yourself. Uh, uh, what, what did you do with the sardine, Tim? Yeah. I made kitsch wall art. <laughs> oh, wow. wow! So they, I made little figurines inside, yeah. um, beads and jazzed them and up. Sold and, them on. And I sell them, Oh, yeah. wow, that is impressive. I mean, yeah. you could sell clothes as easy, isn't it? Like anything in your house is, is easy, but how do we like supersize the selling? That's a really good question because I think if you're a personal seller and a trader, you're doing the same thing. You want to optimize your selling ability. You want to sell your item. So yes. first off, sell on a reputable selling yeah. site. They have sense, the marketing, they have the branding. You're selling alongside other professionals or people that look 
and have like displayed their items nicely. Yeah, they did and a little you... bit of the work for you. It's good. Yeah. Yeah, and also you've got people going on there that are searching for particular items mm -hmm. that you're probably selling. Um, photography. People are really poor with their photography. You've got some examples of this, <laughs> haven't you? Like with, with handbags and, and such. What, what's going wrong? What are people doing wrong? Um, so what I see a lot after shopping on Vinted is people maybe having some personal items in the background. A lot of feet. <laughs> feet my, I know the, I said this, nice this was a <laughs> I, I actually hit my toes in this specially. I did think about that. Um, I do see a lot of this style of picture on selling sites. Yeah. Hang it on the wall. Yeah. Hang it with a lovely background. Um, I oh, often yes. do a, a lifestyle shot as well. So try and copy like the big selling sites. They often do one to give an idea of size. Oh, yeah. What it looks like. Do a bit of modelling. I think that's handy, isn't modeling. it? Handy. And a selfie. Hide action. your toes and hide personal items and reflections. And also key words and descriptions is really important, isn't it? I think this is really interesting. Yeah, this is a good point. SEO. So when you're writing the description, the heading, the title, put as many of the words that associate a buyer to your product. OK. And, and what people want to hear, people love the word, like, retro, mm. vintage. It's funny, isn't it, mm. how it just makes you think in a certain way. <laughs> <laughs> and retro. retro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that works, though, that it kind does of language. Work. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely, yeah, because you'll see things... We often see things that pop up on our Facebook. You think, why am I seeing that? Because it's it tuned in to what, said, what you've searched, yeah. yeah. So it really does work. It obviously does. If you make four hundred quid over the weekend with clothes, I think it's going to give some people some ideas. <laughs> Don't this leave weekend. your clothes hanging around me now. No, that's no. right. Yeah, you'd be coming again. Brilliant. Thank you. Love that. Great stuff, Zoe. Thank Lovely. you so much. Well, someone who loves giving a new lease of life to animals is wildlife filmmaker and artist Robert Fuller. Yes, he is a real you life love him, hero. Yeah, up on his farm in North Yorkshire, he spends his spare time nursing abandoned creatures back to full health. We take a look back when he rests some stoked kids. It doesn't it? <laughs> this is going to be a fascinating moment. See what these two do. After some nervous sniffing and squeaking, the kits are playing together like old friends. Ultimately, these kits will be returned to the wild. To get them ready for that, I'm moving them to an outdoor enclosure. And they'll be joined by another stoat that have been nursing back to health. The enclosure is rigged with cameras, so I can capture footage of them exploring, playing, and snuggling down in the nest chamber. And I've got an ingenious way for the stairs to get even closer to the wild. A secret hatch leads to an underground chamber, so it's the perfect place for the stoats to explore. And what they don't know yet is the final doorway opens up to the great outdoors. So today's a really exciting day. I'm going to open up the grills here and let these stoats out. After three months in my care, they're ready for their next adventure. Mm, how lovely to see their little so journey cute, back actually. to the world. Russell's brilliant. He's a ledge. He is a ledge. Uh, we've got loads of questions. Uh, Dr Poonam, we've got a question from Dawn. We were chatting earlier about the cold weather, how it affects the heart, and she was wondering how does stress and anxiety affect the heart? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. Stress is so complex. I mean, for one, that when we are feeling stressed and anxious, you know, it changes our lifestyle habits. So you may find that you might be drinking more, you may be more inclined mm. to, to do things like smoking, or maybe your eating habits change. But also chronic stress increases all those stress hormones hormones, which can increase your heart rate, your blood pressure over a long period of time, and also increase your inflammation. Oh, okay. So, you know, get the help if you're mm. feeling stressed. Yeah. Oh, we are it, needs to, it needs to grow on you right now. That's not <laughs> It's a wash. It got <laughs> uh, we are going through our side lunges, which is your gladiator fitness move. Uh, and this is to help out with collision. What's the, what's the best kind collision, of Collision, yeah. So coming from the angle of being a contender, mm -hmm. running across that bridge, trying to dodge me and the other gladiator, it is you've got a side lunge we're trying to dodge again disclaimer it's a waste of time you will you won't dodge me okay. but if you want to try then fill your boots all right well for me the challenge will be not having this rip so we'll <laughs> see how that goes <laughs> and we had a bunch of moves from monday or to friday so let's go through those again so first off it was fire and the jabs which is inspired by jewels so we're going to Punch as if we're holding. Guys, our what is this? Is, what is this? This is the most. <laughs> the lack of synchronization feel is unbelievable. We're helping us with the squats. We're going to stand up and then squat 
and then up, <laughs> and squat, and up. <laughs> After that, it was giant with the arm circles for our shoulders. So we were gonna do it just like this. And then we had saber, which was the reach and twist. And reach, reach and, and twist. twist. Your, your eyes are piercing through my soul right now. I'm trying, it's uh, hard. And it's... then the side lunges as well. Now, if you're sitting down, I'd say reach to the side for the side lunges. For the squat, I'd say simply raise your arms up and down. Uh, and the arm circles, you're pretty good. I'm right. happy. It's legend. You're happy, you're legend. Yeah, yeah. We, we... I want to say, I've seen Gethin running outside. I'm not convinced this is even a... <laughs> this is for everyone, my friends. For okay. every exercise for everyone. Uh, and to introduce it, we've got football commentator and the new voice of Gladiators, Guy Mowbray, for the final time this week. Take it away, Guy. With a special Gladiator-inspired workout, <laughs> it's Reese Stevenson <laughs> and legend. <laughs> All right, we're going to jump. Bam! Bam! Oh, yeah. And punch. Bam. And punch. Good. Punch. Yeah. Punch. And then we're going to squat. Mm -hmm. And squat. It's too much for that. Yes. Uh, and uh, rise. I can't, I can't. And again, squat. This is absolutely Hold unbelievable. It. And rise. Arm circles. Mm -hmm. And circles. That's it, legend. Maybe put a smile into it if you feel. No, I don't. Okay. Keep <laughs> going. Good. <laughs> and then we're going to reach and grab. Reach and grab, reach and grab, reach and grab. And then we move on to the side lunges. Here we go. And. Yeah. I feel like Jake oh, can, we get you know? can we get a wider, please? A lot of wider. Good luck to Come on. Come on. To nice and to Reese as well. We'll be back on Monday at 9 30. Have a great weekend. Bye for now. Make it up. Tickle him. It will not crack. I'm not tickling.